Good evening. I'm Tricia Craig, Vice President for Engagement here at the college. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to our first event of the academic year, a conversation with legendary entrepreneur, Kevin Ryan. In addition to everyone on campus, I'm especially pleased to see parents, the wider public in Singapore, and I want to extend a special welcome to entrepreneurs from the Endeavor Network, as well as alumni from both Yale and INSEAD from across Asia, who are here with us tonight to hear our fellow alum. I also want to thank our two co-sponsors this evening, Endeavor, the world's largest high-impact entrepreneurship organization, who are doing so much to promote growth and development in many countries around the globe. I'm very grateful for their help in putting tonight's session together. And we're also pleased to have the Yale NUS Entrepreneurship Society as a co-sponsor. They are viewing this together at a watch party here on campus, which is a very festive and engaging way to hear what Kevin Ryan has to say. And before I turn the proceedings over to our moderators, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. First, we ask that you please do not take screenshots or recordings of tonight's session. Second, we very much welcome audience questions, um, your thoughts, and I imagine there will be many. For those of you on Zoom, um, please enter any questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will try to get to as many questions as possible. Now, let me introduce tonight's moderators, who happen not just to be entrepreneurs, but I'm very proud to say recent graduates of the college. Guadalupe Lazaro is an anthropology major from the class of 2020, who co-founded digital health startup Ease Healthcare, Singapore's first women's health-focused telemedicine platform that has nurtured a community of over 19,000 members. And Daniel Ong, a law and liberal arts grad who was called to the bar today from 2019, is a former Schwartzman scholar who co-founded JustShip, a Singapore-based international shipping service. Guada, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Trisha. Um, so hi, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here. Uh, before Daniel gets us started with some questions, I would like to introduce you to our guest speaker. We're fortunate to have Kevin Ryan with us today, who is a Yale alumnus and an MBA graduate from INSEAD, and is the founder and CEO of Alicorp, an incubator and venture capital fund responsible for transformative companies like MongoDB, Business Insider, Guild, Sola, Nomad Health, and Coedition, among others. Aside from his professional responsibilities, Kevin serves and has served through his career and on the board of several institutions and organizations, such as Yale, INSEAD, Human Rights Watch, Doctors Without Borders, Endeavor, among others. He's an entrepreneur and investor with several years of experience, and we're so excited to have a chance to learn from him today. Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. It's uh, really an honor. Mm, happy to be here. Kevin, I have the privilege of kicking off this conversation today. Um, as you know, Yale and US was founded by Yale University, your alma mater, and the National University of Singapore as the first liberal arts college in Singapore. Can I ask you to reflect a bit on your experiences um, at Yale and what influence you think having a liberal arts education has had on your professional path and on entrepreneurship? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. Um, this session brings a couple of things that are fundamental to my life, which is really entrepreneurship, education, Yale, uh, and even Endeavor. So I think I've uh, touched all sides of this. Um, so I went to Yale as the first person in my high school in a small town in Ohio uh, who had ever been to, or at least in the last 10 or 15 years, to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. It was just not a thing that people did. Um, I had an incredible experience. It was definitely life-changing for me. It sort of upped my game uh, intellectually, the people, the experiences, international, and it really did set me on a path my entire life of you know, business, intellectual interests, success, things like that. And so many things that I've been involved with, I can date back to things I did at Yale. Uh, my introduction to business was through uh, participating in the Yale College Student Investment Group. My introduction to politics was I ran the Liberal Party, which was the uh, Democratic Party of the political union at that time, and I've been very involved ever since. Uh, so great experience for me. Uh, two of my kids uh, went to Yale, and then I was on the board of Yale for six years from 2012 to 2018, and I was on the international committee before that. So I was, I, at every level, I was you know, somewhat involved in the, uh, in the Singapore process. Uh, and I had gone through that because INSEAD had set up a Singapore campus um, by 15, 20 years ago. And I was on the board of, uh, of INSEAD for a good part of that as well. 
Uh, so, so really, um, I, I mean, I think um, learning technology and learning uh, any subject you want is remarkable. The liberal arts education for me is absolutely the best thing. In fact, for my kids, I have one daughter who's at, um, at St. Andrews in Scotland. And one of the reasons that we did not want her to go, and she didn't want to go to the European or English system, is because you generally just study one subject, and it's not as broad. And so I'm a huge fan of taking multiple subjects. The English system, the U.S. system is actually based on the Scottish system, which not everyone knows. And so uh, Scotland has a different system than, than England. Um, so I know so many people, and I'm sure people on this call, who went to college to Yale or or anywhere and planned on majoring in one thing and ended up majoring in something else. Uh, that's an experience you should find out before it's too late. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what's most important to me, and I think uh, I actually, I said this at a Yale board meeting, which was, was not made public, but I said that I thought the Yale NUS project was possibly the most significant thing Yale has done in the last quarter century. It's a pretty strong thing to say, but I think it is. I think it has been beneficial for all the students. I think it's beneficial for Asian education. You know, it really was one of the first examples of liberal education. I mean, there were many good schools before that, but not necessarily with this approach. And I think there have been other schools that are starting to incorporate it, to copy it. So I think uh, speaking as a former trustee, a huge success and really happy to have been involved with it. Thank you so much for your support uh, for Yale and U.S. It's really great to, to hear that. Um, can I just pick your brains a little bit more on liberal arts and entrepreneurship? Like, mm -hmm. how how has that? Um, I mean, especially for those liberal arts graduates or students right now in the audience, right? Um, how can they best reap their liberal arts experience if they plan to pursue entrepreneurship? Yeah, look, eighty percent of you know starting a company is understanding people, understanding a market, you know, understanding uh, how to manage people, recruit people, communicate, you know. What you don't realize when you become CEO is you become a traveling salesperson. No one thinks mm -hmm. they want to be a salesperson, but you're selling, you know, because you're trying to recruit someone. So you're selling the company to them. You're literally selling because you're trying to bring revenues in. You're selling a part of the company because you're, in, you're talking to investors. So all day long, you are pitching, communicating. That's what you're doing as CEO. Now, I do think that if I were back in college, getting more technical skills and having exposure to computer science um, exploring, expo exposure to health-related topics is, mm. is very important. That's one thing I would have done more of. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to major in that, mm. but you have to come out these days feeling comfortable in a world of technology. Because even if you think you're going into a field, you know, that we, we, I started a company in meth addiction. I don't think that's technology, but we are using technology. We're using systems. Mm. We're using digital therapeutics to solve the problem. And so you'll see in the legal world, in every single world, Technology is a part of what you need to learn, uh, but you don't necessarily need to, to major in it. Um, so I think it's the broad skills it's, uh, that are important. And that's the reason that, you know, the, the, if you look at the entrepreneurs who come out of and lead the largest companies in the United States, most of them had a broad liberal arts education coming out of a top school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm interested to hear a little bit about, uh, you were talking about how entrepreneurship is about, you know, the people you choose to work with, the teams that you build. So I guess when you think back to your earliest so, sort of endeavors, can you tell us a little bit more about what the process of building those were, was like, uh, building the teams, finding the right people, you know, managing the stress of a startup, uh, finding funding, like if you could walk us a little bit through that journey. Yeah, so my first experience was a quite extraordinary experience. So it was in 1996. And I was 32 or 33, and I joined a 10-person company called DoubleClick. And DoubleClick today is a huge, it dominates the ad technology world as a part of Google. Um, and so I joined there, and four years later, we had 2,000 employees and offices in 25 countries. We had also gone public only 24 months after we started, which you can basically not even do anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you think of the challenge of going from 10 to 2,000 in four years, you know, at the peak, I had 27 full-time in-house recruiters because this was a enormous military operation to be able to, to subdivide to, and to do this. The other thing we had to do was convince people that internet advertising was going to work. Let's not forget in 1995, there was almost zero internet advertising. And so we're starting a company that is, that is you know, providing the infrastructure for something that doesn't exist. It's like building the mm -hmm. highway system, but there are no cars right now. And so you can imagine that's a little bit of a sell. So I was evangelizing the entire time for those four years. 
to try and convince people that this was going to work. And luckily, you know, it went from zero to three billion in ad spend during those four years, and today is probably sixty billion. So that original vision uh, has come true. And so, uh, really, I spent those four years very operational. Um, you know, just building, hiring, making mistakes along the way. I bought I bought companies that didn't work out. I hired some people that didn't work out. But you just have to think of yourself as a professional athlete. You know, when when Ronaldo misses a penalty kick. He doesn't sit there and go, I'm going to retire. I'm a terrible player. He just thinks, you know what? I'm better than most people. I'm going to miss some once in a while, but I hit a lot of them. And so I'm just not going to lose any confidence. And so, you you know, being an entrepreneur means you're going to have to take failure. Uh, it may be a failure of a company. It may be failure of individual projects, but basically things are going to go wrong. You've got to endure that. And that's what makes it exciting. You know, if you go join an enormous company with, 500,000 employees, what you do doesn't matter that much. And you know, it. you may have a good experience, but it just doesn't mm -hmm. matter that much. Whereas here, it really, it really does. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess I wonder, like building such large teams, like how do you build the right team culture as well, right? Like things can get out of hand pretty quickly, especially with such high growth. Kevin, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'm, uh, for everyone, I'm 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 doing this from a um, lounge at the Charles de Gaulle Airport uh, in Paris because my flight got delayed. Uh, so there's a little bit of noise around me. So, um, yeah, the culture is something that you can't fully determine. You know, you do everything you can. You try and set an example as CEO and as a management team. You know, the, the senior ten people that you have are going to determine a lot of that culture. Uh, you're trying to set examples. You're trying to reward the right things and, and you know, make sure you discourage the things that are not good. But once you get to be bigger, some things are going to happen without you. So you, know, you can't just say, I want a culture of sharing. That, mm -hmm. just, that doesn't mean anything. Obviously, you do. Everyone does. Um, I want a culture of performance. What does that even mean? But it's the examples you set every day that people know they have to do a good job. They have to try and do things on time. There are going to be mistakes. You're going to support people, but it's also a very careful balance because out of every 10 people you hire, you're going to realize that one or two are just not the right people. Mm -hmm. It could be your mistake. It could be the right, wrong culture here, but you have to make changes and you have to treat it the way if we were talking about the, uh, the New York Yankees. Every Yankee fan knows that there are just one or two players that are not as good as other players in their position on the other team. You know, they're just, there's statistics to tell you that. And if the team wants to get better, you have to make those changes. But you also don't want everyone on your team to feel like, oh my God, I could get replaced at any time. You want to feel like this is a meritocratic system that we're going to give people uh, fair treatment. If someone's not working out, we're going to explain to them why it's not working out, give them a chance. But if 30 or 60 days later, it's not changing, then you're going to have to make a change. And that's hard to do. You know, one of the hardest things when you go really quickly is having to go to someone and say, you know what, you were great as a manager. We promoted you to director. And guess what? It's not working. And we, we, we took a risk on you and we're gonna have to bring in another director who has more experience because it's not working here. And that person often leaves, they feel uh, unmotivated uh, and it can be a casualty and it's hard to handle those things well. Mm -hmm. So there's no playbook, but at the end of the day, when you are fair, um, as transparent as possible and, as, and people believe in the mission, you can generally build a really great company. Mm -hmm. Kevin, can I explore more about what you alluded to a bit um, when you were sharing about DoubleClick just now um, about growing and scaling company? I think it's incredible that you grew a company like that in four years. Um, and, and this, of course, is what our co-sponsor Endeavor also does, right? Um, high impact entrepreneurship where scale yeah. ups lead to growth and job creation, which, I, which you shared earlier that you were part of. Um, yeah. Based on your experience, whether with Endeavor or in VC or your own personal um, um, startups, what, what makes companies good candidates for growth, growth and what are pitfalls that companies should try to avoid? Yeah, well, so the good candidates for growth are the ones that are, I mean, in a market that they're getting feedback where they say, you know what? Um, basically, at the end of the day, I remind people, business is business. So you're trying to put $1 in, which means you're spending it generally on people, sometimes on computers, and you're trying to get $3 out. And you know, if that's happening, you're doing something great. Now, sometimes it takes two years, three years, four years, five years for that to come out, but ultimately that has to be happening. If that is happening, 
then you need to pour on more resources. And so another candidate for growth is, is there something where more growth is helpful? Growth is good in and of itself, obviously, if it's, if it's good return on equity. But sometimes like at DoubleClick, the reason DoubleClick today is the number one ad tech company in the world is because of those four years. My competitors couldn't keep up. They weren't in 25 countries. And so when Procter & Gamble needed to make a decision, they wanted a company that had presence in, in 25 countries, not in six countries. And so then they said, well, we're gonna go with DoubleClick. And then 10 other companies were like, well, if Procter & Gamble and Microsoft are going to DoubleClick, then we should probably do the same thing. And so we had you know, the largest share of market in 2000 and, and the company has never given it up today, even though it's 25 years late, 20 years late. Um, now you also need to be able to finance this. So all great companies lose a tremendous amount of money. And you have to think of a company the way you do a building. If you're building a building from scratch, and it, let's say it takes four years to get through the architect drawings and then the construction and everything. And I said to you after two years, so are you making money yet? You'd say, well, that's absurd. My building's not finished yet. Of course, I'm not making money. That's that you don't understand about real estate. I will start making money when my building or my hotel is open. And until then, I'm just going to lose you know, $200 million where I build this, this huge building. Companies are the same way. You know, mm. Mongo, which I started 14 years ago, has never had a profitable quarter. 14 years in, it's today worth $25 billion. And so very smart investors, it's been public for four years, have looked at that and said, you know, we believe that the investments you're making, because uh, it's still growing at 40% a year, um, the investments you're making are great. And a, this is going to be an enormously profitable company. And so we're going to keep funding that and supporting that. And they also see that our margins are getting better and better. Um, so you've got to be able to sell that to people. Without money, you can't expand. But in general, it starts with a good, a big market, a ability to uh, create a product that people want, great execution. So people are willing to reward you. If your first three countries don't work, there's no reason going to 10. Um, and then great execution and a little bit of luck. Mm. Mm. Kevin, th thanks for that. That was, that was really enlightening. Uh, I wanted to ask a bit more about your thoughts on financing. I think this is also, I guess, uh, a question that is something I ponder about a lot. Um, as, as an early stage entrepreneur, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on bootstrapping versus you know, early stage fundraising, right? When you're giving out mm -hmm. um, equity, usually at um, you know, a, a cheaper rate, right? And I think a more general question, what do investors look at uh, during the early different stages of fundraising? Yeah. So look, there's a trade-off and this is, there's no black and white answer. Obviously not giving up part of the company is a good idea if you can grow very quickly. In general, I'm always in favor of raising outside money. Mm. Now, you only want to raise enough money that to take you to the next proof points. So you start a company today, let's say the market values it at $5 million. And so that's what it's worth. You raise a million dollars. The question you have to answer is, if I spend a million dollars, which obviously you can't do bootstrapping uh, unless you have a million dollars lying around, um, will that make your company 20% more valuable? That's it. And generally the answer is yes, that money going in is a good idea. And also don't forget, it's a very competitive market. There are so many smart entrepreneurs out there. If you have a good idea and I literally, I see your idea and I watch you for three months and you're bootstrapping. So you have like four people. I'm going to sit there and go, you know what? I can take these guys. I don't mind starting four months later. They've proven that there's a market there. I'm going to raise $2 million. Mm. I'm going to hire 20 people. I'm going to bury these people. It's the exact equivalent of if we were starting a marathon and I'm 57, and if you saw me 300 yards ahead of you at the beginning, are you going to be intimidated? You'd be like, the dude's old. I'm going to catch him in the next 26 uh, miles. So it's not a problem at all for me. That's what I'm going to look at. And that's what everyone is doing. So time is never on your side as an entrepreneur, right? Someone is going to get out. If this is a good idea, other people are going to smell it. And so you've got to move quickly. So here's another way of looking at it. Name the 10, 10 the name of how many unicorns were bootstrapped? Zero. Mm, yeah. I think of one, so, yeah. <laughs> so if you are bootstrapping for a long time, what you're telling me is you're not trying to build a huge company. And I would rather end up with 10% of a billion dollar company than 100% of something that's worth $20 million. You got to go for it. And it, by the way, another thing that's true is that money is so available today. We are in a golden age of capital. 
So in some ways, it's it's cheaper and uh, to to raise money now than it ever has been. So you should get out there and do it. And what do companies? What do VCs look for? In it changes on the stage. In the very beginning, they're really people and idea. That's all you. That's all you have. You got three people. You've done a little bit of work. You haven't proven that much yet. Now, more the more you go along, the more people are going to look at your results. You know, now I see your product. Is it working? Pretty soon I see the data. When I'm raising money in my third round, they're going to look at the data room and say, "Look, are you doing a good job?" You know, when we see, I have a company called Zola, which is a wedding registry, which is very successful. Yeah, uh, they look at the data. If couples, are you making money? What's the long-term value? What's the cost of acquisition? It becomes much more data intensive at that point, and your charm becomes less important because they can see the results. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I guess, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm interested to hear a little bit. It seems from your volunteer and philanthropic uh, work that you have a very strong social commitment sort of to the world. Um, from that work and your experience in business, could you tell us a little bit more about how can we build successful companies that are socially responsible as well? Yeah, and look, that, that's a that it's a it's a nuanced answer because I think every time you build a company that ends up with 100 or 1,000 employees, um, you are contributing to this overall mm-hmm. ecosystem. And so you are creating jobs. You're not just creating your own jobs. You're creating the, the, the supplier jobs and things like that, which is helping. The second thing is that people are generally buying your product. If you get to 100 people, someone's buying your product. They're buying your product because it's either cheaper, which means you are actually giving back to people in some way, or better. You're making the world a better place in some way. Um, mm-hmm. So all of those are important. Um, now, on, this, on the social good side, there's obviously there's nonprofits, there's public benefit corporations that are kind of in the middle. I just started a company in the psychedelic space aimed at mental illness, and we set it up as a public benefit corporation. So 10% of all the equity, of the day one equity that is going to be given when, whenever there's any liquidation um, to nonprofits in the, in the mental illness space. Um, so there's many different ways of giving back. You know, Look, a lot of entrepreneurs also, uh, the top ones, are giving huge percentages, generally more than half of their fortune after they make that money. And that's something that you know, 250 years ago, no one did. And today mm. is, is the norm. So mm. all of those are different ways of giving back. Um, but yeah, I've been... Oh. In the United States, in Singapore, all over the world, there's enormous problems, as we all know. Many things could be better, and we all need to play our role in helping. Thank you. Kevin, um, is your connection okay? Like, are you there? Okay. It, yeah, it's, okay. From, it's going in and out, but it, it's, it's, I can hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I just want to ask a question um, now based on um, COVID, like now we see travel reopening and I mean, you are in the airport, uh, people going back to work, more vaccines. And so to speak, we're kind of seeing the beginning of a post COVID world. Um, so what do you think is important for companies transitioning out of COVID and is the future of work changing? Yeah, so I think the, the, the change is overblown. And uh, you know what we saw in New York in March, people were like, "Oh my God, no one's going to come back. Uh, no one's going to go to a restaurant." And the moment restaurants were open, you cannot get a table in a restaurant in New York right now. It's impossible. So that's that's what post COVID looks like, which is everyone goes back and does the same things they're doing before. What will the changes be? There'll be a little bit less travel, uh, no question. Much it used to be viewed badly if you didn't show up at a board meeting and and did it, you know, or on the phone. Now that'll be, uh, it's, it's a great thing. I think business travel will be cut back by 30%, you know, conferences, things like that. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's one impact. I do think that we're going to have a more remote workforce. So, uh, you know, Guadalupe, Argentina is a great example. You know, you really have to answer the question, why pay an engineer in New York uh, 125000 yeah. when I can really get someone who's just as good um, in Argentina for whatever, 40000 and so we're going to see a truly global workforce. You know, the, the technology infrastructure is going to become like the Premier League in soccer, where no one cares where you're from. It, can you do the job? You can score goals. Anyone will hire you. Um, and that, that's a wonderful thing for talented, 
technology oriented people around the world. So I think that will be, um, that will have an impact as well. Having said all that, you know, what you're seeing, people are going back to big cities. You know, they're not big in big cities because they have to be in the office every day with their coworkers. They're in big cities because when they're not in the office, they want to be at a great nightclub. They want to be at a great restaurant. They want to be see great ballet. They want to see professional basketball. They want to see things like that. So the draw of the city has not gone away. Mm. Mm. And I think that's really interesting, right? On the point of a remote workforce, the companies will have, you know, truly international, diverse, global communities, not unlike Yale and US. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, I want to ask another question um, based on a post-COVID startup explosion. Singapore specifically um, saw startups raise $5.3 billion in the first half of 2021, um, compared to 3.4 in 2020. Uh, so more generally, where are you seeing opportunities that might arise after COVID for entrepreneurs? Yeah, so look, we've seen what COVID did was just accelerate the move to digital. So mm-hmm. in every category, whether it's you know uh, remote uh, healthcare work, remote buying, people's you know grandparents who had never purchased groceries online had to, and now they're like, wow, this is great. I don't want to go to the store anymore. Um, uh, so every it jump started. We had five years of growth that happened in one year. Uh, online gaming, online news. So it, in a way, it didn't change anything dramatically. It just accelerated everything. Now, what's also been happening is you're just seeing this availability of capital. And since returns are higher in the startup world, um, startups are just bleeding the large companies. So the, the Johnson & Johnson or the Procter & Gamble or these large companies, they're still doing okay. They're making money but their growth has been hit. You know, uh, MongoDB, my database company, um, grows at 40% a year and Oracle has been growing at, you know, I don't know, 2% a year. And so that would have been 4% a year or 6% a year if Mongo and other companies had not been taking market share from them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's happening everywhere. You know, let's not forget that capital drives a lot of these things. So why did we not have a single successful new car startup in 50 years? Since 1950, there's never been a successful car startup. Every brand you see was started you know, before that. And then Tesla comes along. And the reason was that you couldn't raise $5 billion before break even to start a company. No one would give you that money. Now that they will, you know, anything is possible. Anything is possible. I, I'm invested in a company that's in the nuclear fission space that you know, may, may take $10 billion, $20 billion um, to get to break even. And they think they can get it you know, over time. And so that's what's changing. It used to be that, of course, only a large company could do these things. And they had to get to be large over 30 years, and then they were unassailable. But now anyone can do it. Uh, so that's, that's the big change. So look, I think there are opportunities in every single sector. Even mm-hmm. mature sectors like e-commerce in the United States have become so big that narrow examples that, you know, can start to work. Like in the beginning, you had an e-commerce site, and then you had a clothing site, and then someone sets up a, a shoe site. And then someone says, well, not just a shoe site, a sneaker site. And now there's multiple sneaker sites. So all that makes sense when you have billions and billions of dollars. It subdivides more and more. And so the opportunities that are available in second and third world countries are much higher level, broader, like a car site. Uh, and the ones that are in the more developed countries are slightly narrower because their markets are so big. Mm. No, I, I think you made really, really great points. And actually, in fact, both just ship, like my company and East squad us, both of us started during COVID. And I think you're perfectly right to say that things, COVID really accelerated a lot of things mm-hmm. for us. And I just want to make a comment. Like when you said, did you say nuclear fission company? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. That sounds <laughs> pretty incredible. Um, yeah. I, I will hand it over to Guada now. We'll take questions from the floor. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for for your incredible insights. Uh, We discussed from liberal arts and sort of social impact in entrepreneurship to scaling a company, building a team. I guess, uh, yeah, turning over to the floor now, we have many questions from the audience on all kinds of topics. So uh, just a quick note to the audience, please keep your questions coming in and type them into the Q&A box. We'll try our best to cover as many as we can and keep your questions concise and please tell us who you are and where you're from. For example, you're your student or you're a um, okay, so the first two questions that are coming in are from the watch party at the Yale and U.S. Entrepreneurship Society. So many, one of our questions is that many students in Yale and U.S. have aspirations to build a startup while in college. 
As a serial entrepreneur with numerous companies, how would you advise students to balance their academics and entrepreneurial aspirations? Yeah, and I'll give you an answer that's different than you would expect, which is that you know, the data shows that the vast majority of startups started by people in college or as they graduate don't work. Um, I, the, the sweet spot of my sector is sort of 26 to 40. People who've gotten a couple years experience, worked somewhere, learned how to see things, manage things, learn some skills. Mm -hmm. um, so does it happen? Mark Zuckerberg did it. And, but you can do it easily when you don't need to hire senior people who, you know, frankly, it's hard to get a experienced person with 10 years experience to come work for you when you're 21, which is hard. At 26, it becomes a little bit easier. So I don't completely discourage it, but um, you just got to be careful and, and knowledgeable of that. I actually think for most people, the best path is to go join a startup, a successful startup, one that's maybe 30 to 300 people that has raised money, it's on its way, that's growing new opportunities. So you're, it's small enough that you can see the CEO, you see the CFO, you watch what's happening, you know what's there. When I'm looking for a CEO to run one of our companies, what I want is someone who is a senior exec in a startup. They don't have to have ever been a CEO before, but I want them to be close to it and have seen what's happened and then I can make, they can make the leap into being a CEO. But if you're doing it during college, it can be a great experience and some people, even if it doesn't work, feel like they learned a tremendous amount and it helped them later on. The key is getting people. And so, you know, like if I said to you, uh, you're going to start a, a soccer team and, you know, a couple of people from your high school who play soccer. So you're thinking of going pro. That's not going to work. Right. They're just not good enough to go pro. Mm -hmm. You know, playing soccer is not the same thing as saying I'm one of the you know, 100 best players in the world. And so in soccer, we all know that that your friends just can't do that. Um, but in startups, people are like, oh, yeah, I've got a friend, and I think he even studied some computer science, so he'll be a great co-founder. But the question is, is he really world-class or she? Are they really that good? I'm not sure. And at the end of the day, what makes a difference is having people that are extraordinarily good at what they do. And that's what you have to be very selective about. And most that's people true. fail that. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, I guess they have a follow-up question, which is uh, kind of tied to the previous one, which is uh, uh, when you go from an idea to a company, what are the things that you look out for to move forward in a project? Um, so the building blocks of a company, there's only three. They're idea, people, and money. Everything else is just a product of those things. So um, the most important thing, when I, I start, uh, you know, I start generally four to six companies per year. So I have a whole team. Uh, we're going to green light two companies in the next two weeks. So we do this. And so we come up with an idea. We generally test the idea by spending a month doing a 50-page PowerPoint presentation, which just allows us to flesh out our thoughts. That's basically based on talking to potential customers. So I need to get a sense, We you know, if you were a potential customer, would you be interested in this idea? And then we're trying to say, can we build a product? Because in the beginning, everything's about product. It's not about marketing, it's not about anything else. Can we build a product? We have a vision for a product that is different from what is out there. If I just open up a Japanese restaurant across the street, it's not going to stand out. There are other Japanese restaurants. I've got to have something that is fundamentally different. It's got to be better food, better decor, and, but not just a little bit better, but really better. And so that's what I'm trying. And sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong, but that's what I'm focused on. Then I need to build the team. And so that's the hardest part. Can I really get those superstars on the team? Uh, there. Um, and at that point, it's just working together and implementing. And hopefully six months later, we have a product. Um, I don't worry about finance. I mean, uh, finance person, because I don't have any revenues. I don't worry about marketing because we haven't launched yet. I need a great product. You know, Mongo, we did not do any marketing really. And no one paid us for the product for two years. We just had it out there because we needed the product to get better and better and better and hear feedback. So that's what's really important, getting your product out there quickly Whatever you, you had some good thoughts, but some of them are right, some of them are wrong. You learn very quickly and then you refine and, and move on. Uh, but life is about product in startups. It's not about, you know, when you're a private equity person, you can just, you know, uh, cut costs, not improve the product. And maybe you can do a good job at that, but that's not what we do. We have to create great products. Kevin, um, just a question from Mike Hawk. Um, are Silicon Valley's best days behind it? 
what are the best up and coming cities for tech startups in the US and globally? Thank you. Yeah, so in general, I can always tell you the number one city for startups in your country. And that is basically the place where if I go interview the students coming out of the top 10 universities in your, in your country, where, where do they want to live? Mm-hmm. And where they want to live, that's where the startup center is going to be because we are disproportionately the product of top students from top universities who have the drive, have that special something and get things done. And so in the United States, where do they want to live? That group, the number one place they want to live in New York is, is New York. San Francisco historically was the tech center and had a monopoly on it 25 years ago. Now it absolutely doesn't. It's losing market share all the time. It's still a great place to be. San Francisco has a particular problem that the quality of life has deteriorated there in a way that has not happened in New York. Um, You know, the crime rate is up, uh, all kinds of challenges with homelessness in San Francisco. They have not built enough housing. So there's no reason why San Francisco housing is the same as New York. New York has a differentiated product. So, uh, San Francisco is bleeding a little bit of market share looking forward to the Austins, the Salt Lakes, the Denvers, the Seattles, places like that. But what we're going to see everywhere is we're going to see more and more successful startups, but we're also going to continue to see this consolidation um, that, you know, when, when I, 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 there were 34 people who worked at DoubleClick who later on in their career started a company. That's from one company. That's a sort of Adam and Eve who have kids and they have kids and keep going. And that's happening in startups all over the world. And they tend to do it across the street. They tend to say, you know what? I live here. I like my apartment. I'm going to do it right here Um, because they can get money. They can get people. So the winners win more. But I think the one city that's going to lose a little bit of market share is San Francisco. You know, in Europe, where I spend more time, um, Berlin has done a very good job because they had uh, cheap real estate, uh, a lot of Eastern Europeans coming in. So Berlin has done well. But the other cities are the ones that, you, frankly, you'd mostly want to live in, which they're, uh, they're you know, Barcelona, they're London, they're Paris, they're Amsterdam. So those are the cities that are doing well in startups. Mm-hmm. I think that's also really congruent with what you were just uh, saying in response to Guada's question. Um, and where people want to be is essentially where startups should be. Yeah, that's a yeah. good point. Yeah. Well, the way to think of it is if you, if you said where are oil companies, they're generally near oil, right? That's sort of obvious. Well, the oil for our industry are people in their 20s and 30s who are super smart and super motivated. And so you need to be where those people are. I mean, it can be great to live in a tiny town in Oklahoma, but I can't build a company there. Mm. Interesting. Um, I first hear a student actually from Yale in US has a really interesting question that's very tied to current affairs. So uh, they ask, I have an education startup in China. Recently, there has been a series of policies that has caused multiple education companies to experience drastic losses in stock price. I was wondering whether you have experience and um, favorable government policies and how you dealt with them. More broadly, do you believe that recent crackdowns in China will have a negative effect in, on innovation and startups? Yeah, so look, I, you know, we had multiple offices in China for DoubleClick. Since then, I actually personally avoid doing business in China. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's extremely difficult as a non-Chinese company to be successful. Um, uh, You know, it's a very competitive environment, which is one of the reasons it's hard. Uh, I also think that the rules are not always fair for non-Chinese players. They're not even fair for Chinese players sometimes, and it's very opaque. And I certainly am not in a good position to compete in that world. So if you're Chinese and you live in China, you need to do things there. But I, I think what they've been doing recently is going to discourage. I mean, if, if, if you said to me, I can start this company in China or in the United States or Europe, I'd say go somewhere where it's a level playing field and that's not China. Um, but obviously there are many successful startups there and it's a growing economy and a lot of good things, but it's not the place for me. And you just got to decide if it's the place for you. Interesting. Thank you, Kevin. Um, another question from Mahiro Noda, a high school student from Thailand. Um, she wants to know what your take on the transformation workforce and the presence of AI, robots, and other <laughs> emerging high tech um, that could that could risk unemployment could risk unemployment of human workers, and how can entrepreneurs best take advantage of technology while maintaining the balance with communication and network with people? Okay, so. I want you to imagine a situation. It's 1996, beginning of double quick. You and I are having a conversation. And I said to you, look, I actually, for reasons I can't explain to you, know the future. 
and that 25 years from now, which is going to be 2021, there will be uh, $600 billion of e-commerce, which doesn't even exist today, but it's going to move out of the stores into online. Also, 50% of manufacturing jobs are going to go away. All bank tellers are going to go away. Most travel agents are going to go away. And I could just keep going through the impact of technology uh, in, in automation over the next 25 years. And so I, then you say to me, wow, that's, that seems devastating. What's the unemployment rate going to be? And the answer is the unemployment rate is lower today than it was 25 years ago. So how did that happen? It's not like, the, it's not like robots mm -hmm. and technology and automation are starting today. We've been doing this for 25 or 50 years. So what has happened is that there has been dislocation, but I'm very bullish that actually, you know, we're seeing a labor shortage in the United States in many areas. We're seeing it in Europe. And so we've already, we, this, this movie has already, we're already two thirds of the way through this movie. And the movie is good in the sense that, yes, there are people along the way who lose jobs and that can be difficult, but fundamentally the, we do adjust, adjust and different jobs get created. Uh, and so that it has to be well managed. There are certain countries have handled it well. For me, the Northern European countries have handled this whole process better than we have, um, but it can be done. So technology will continue uh, and it'll, um, it'll, we will adjust. I think that's a, it's a great response. I think it's also a reminder that technology is not doom and gloom, right? But it's actually opportunity, like what you mentioned. Um, so yeah, th thanks, thanks for sharing that insight, yeah. I guess I'm, I'm personally a little curious about, I mean, we stop, spoke a little bit about China as a market, but um, I guess we're a little bit interested about when you think of, about Asia, where do you see strengths? Like, are you concerned that, you know, the, the regulatory environment in China maybe affects other sort of innovations popping up across like Asia as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I, look, the Asia market is an incredible market. Um, and so it's growing, uh, lots of young people. There's so many good things, uh, happening there. And I apologize for this baby in the background. Um, the, uh, so a lot of good things happening there. You know, I think many of us are disappointed in terms of the sort of democratic civil society infrastructure that is being created in many, many countries. You know, Thailand is not as free and open as we would like. Uh, many countries in Asia are not. Um, many countries in other parts of the world are not. You know, I get worried about some, some things that are happening in the United States. So it's not, it's not a one place, but you know, we would all like to have a kind of cleaner, better system. And look, I think systems like Singapore that have been, you know, frankly, quite well run or Ireland um, are reaping the benefits and are doing extraordinarily well and deserve a lot of the credit for what they're doing. Not that everything is perfect in either country, but a lot of good decisions and a lot of care on human talent and a lot of encouragement of entrepreneurship, um, a, lot of, a lot of great things happening there. And I don't see that same level in, in many other countries and many other countries in Asia. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, a question, another question from the floor from Rio Ho. Uh, his question's about talent, uh, especially for early stage startups. Uh, his question is, what advice would you give to startups in terms of overcoming the chicken egg challenge when it comes to talent and growth. Good talent is expensive. So start, a small startup might find it hard to attract good talent. Yet, well, yet without good talent, it's difficult to build a great product and achieve great growth. Yeah, there's no black and white answer here because you absolutely have to have great talent. And great talent in a way is not expensive because uh, you know, a good, what's different is in, in, if we're talking about accountants, a good accountant is a little bit better than an accountant that's not that good. A good engineer is 10 times as good as an engineer. You know, if you showed me a very difficult math problem, I, I, I could spend an infinite amount of time and I won't be able to answer it. Someone right next to me might be able to solve it in two minutes. What's our relative value? He's literally infinitely better. Um, now, I don't have unlimited cash to give him or her. I have to give equity. So people have to believe in what we're doing. And so most people that, most companies that can't attract good people, the core problem is that they actually can't get people to believe in the mission or the CEO. Because let's put it this way. If I came to you today and can absolutely convince you that my company is going to both, has an incredible mission and is going to be worth a billion dollars, would you join? Of course you join. Yeah. <laughs> of course you join. So if you're not, what you're really saying is, I just don't quite believe. Now, 
it's a never easy. It's hard to believe that something out of nowhere is going to be worth a billion dollars. But some CEOs are able to persuade amazing people to come join, take the risk, quit their job. Uh, that's what I had to do every day at DoubleClick was persuade people to take a salary that was half of what they were getting in a safe company and come join a startup. And sometimes I got them and sometimes I didn't. That's amazing, yeah. Um, I think that's a struggle that a lot of uh, early st um, stage startups are usually yeah. face. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, we have a question from, from the audience. So Yang Sao asks, how does entrepreneurship in science and commercial entrepreneurship interact or how to make it a positive sum game so that technologies and scientific advancement can be coordinated and benefit society? You know, look, the, I, I, globally, we can't do that much other than the governments, like you know, the US government and other governments do have grants that they can select where to go. But the rest of us, you know, the vast majority of technology is benefiting, you know, civilization. Mm -hmm. Look, every single thing that's happening in healthcare, just about, is tackling a problem that is trying to make things better. And in well-run countries, you know, life expectancy is good and things are getting better and we should be able to solve things. So I feel very good there. In material science, in energy, I mean, let's, let's not forget, we've had remarkable leaps in energy in the last 10 years and 20 years. You know, the cost of solar has dropped by 90%. Um, so many good things are happening uh, there. And that's all due to academic work. You know, one of the things I remind people is that almost everything that's happening in the world in the last 50 years that has world, moved the world forward started on the campus of one of maybe 100 worldwide universities. You may be excited that you know, Tesla's doing great things and think Elon Musk deserves credit, but actually the core battery technology you know, was created. Those breakthroughs happened on a campus somewhere. And so we, that's why I've always felt proud to be part of research institutions. And it's very easy when you have 100 projects, a bunch of them don't work out, a bunch of studies you know, fail completely, but there's no way to have breakthrough research without doing that. And I'll give you one more example that if this were 1880, we'd be talking about Heidelberg University, which was one of the leading institutions in the world that went to send missions to South America to discover things. You know what? We don't hear about them anymore. What happened? They did not invest in the research and development that the U.S. universities have done, and they lost their global position. And so that can happen if you don't make that investment and encourage it and think long term and take chances. And that's what's happening in many, many great institutions. And, um, and I think more and more of it's happening every day. Um, we need government funding and private funding to make that happen. And then we need private funding after that to take those ideas that are commercializable and change the world. And we're doing it every day. Mm. One of the things, by the way, I'm excited about is that if we were here 20 years ago, I would have said, and I, it would have been true that Frankly, very little, or 25 years ago, very little cutting edge research was occurring in China or anywhere in Asia, and only a limited amount in Europe. Today, you know, China is doing amazing research in, in many different places, private and public. Uh, Europe is upping their game. And so the worldwide you know, effort on research is improving and that will pay off and we will see those benefits 10, 20 years from now. Hmm. Yeah, I study at Tsinghua and one of the things that they're very proud of is that they are almost catching, catching up with MIT in terms of like uh, computer science and AI research. Yeah. Um, yeah, on the point in regards to like, you know, technology research, uh, I think some people are very fascinated by your comment on nuclear fission and the start mm -hmm. you were talking about. Um, which country do you think has the biggest growth potential for nuclear fission in the next 20 years? And where is it easiest to build or acquire a company in that field? Yeah, so in the entire nuclear field, um, you know, it's fascinating because as, as probably everyone knows, you know, Japan had been very strong. France had been very strong. They're just one-off examples. And then the U.S. has been very controversial since Three Mile Island. So to mm -hmm. date, even though people like Bill Gates are very supportive of expanding into nuclear, um, I would not say that there's a consensus that uh, we should do it. So I actually think that it'll be mostly in, uh, in Europe and in Asia that we'll see uh, progress there. Mm. And it won't be, it'll just because one government or one set of people decide, you know what, we're gonna take a chance on this. And we think it is you know, safe for long-term and we can produce our own energy. We don't have to rely on dirty coal or dirty energy or many countries that don't have oil um, you know, want to be self-sufficient. That's what France did and did it pretty frankly, pretty successfully uh, mm. over time. 
So the country that I'm uh, working with is actually in uh, Switzerland, um, but is looking at uh, Eastern European markets and other markets as well, but it's very early stage. Mm -hmm. I think to follow up to, to I mean, this is a similar vein. Um, which green energy technology do you think is easier to get into the startup? And also you think it's the most potential uh, to grow as a startup? So look, energy is a hard space for startups because it really does take a lot of capital. Mm. And so, you know, it is hard for a 21 year old to, to do that. Um, you know, you're really gonna have to have a science-based uh, breakthrough. But, you know, I, we're still seeing uh, great progress in solar. We're seeing great progress in wind. The breakthrough we need is battery technology. You know, we still have this problem of storing energy uh, in various places, but making progress in iron air batteries. So I'm actually very, very uh, bullish that we are finally tackling this problem. I thought we were going to need carbon pricing to do it. Uh, we're not getting carbon pricing in most places but the market is actually solving the problem. You know, what we do see in general is that there are all kinds of problems with the, the capitalist system, but when you put a large reward in front of a lot of people, you know, there's no better system in solving it. And so right now, a lot of the smartest people on this planet are tackling this problem and they're gonna make a tremendous amount of progress. We're gonna be, we're, you know, one final thing I'd say is that if this were 1990, it's very easy for most people in the call to forget that we would be talking about two things. One is that the world is going to run out of food. That was a somewhat generally accepted risk that, you know, was in the future and that we're going to run out of oil. You know, just at some point you had to run out of both. And both of those were completely wrong. You know, there's not even any conversation about that. We're never going to run out of either one because uh, technology has solved it on both, uh, on both cases. Today, you know, what we're, we're you know, worried about is uh, climate change. And I think we're gonna solve it, um, but unfortunately it may take longer than we think. Um, and so I'm nervous about that um, because we don't, if we were, if, we're, if the private sector could have the incentives to solve it, it would, but so far those incentives have not been put into place. You know, if we had a carbon tax and we doubled or tripled the cost of energy right now for everyone, then the private sector would solve this very, very quickly. Mm. That's super interesting. Um, I guess one, two last questions so that we can start wrapping up. Some some viewers would like to hear a little bit about like some personal reflections. So uh, Shanshan Chang asks, um, entrepreneurship needs dedication and hard work. How do you balance career and family? And Anil Kumar asks, what motivates you today at this stage in your life? Yeah. Oh, okay. Don't worry, he'll be back. Francis, great airport Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, if you ask Ronaldo Ren or Amit, sorry. Sorry, I think your Wi-Fi got disconnected for a little oh. bit, so. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I was just saying that um, I, I keep doing this because I enjoy it. It's like asking, why does Ronaldo still play soccer? You know, he has enough money to retire. And he would say, wait a second, I love playing soccer. I'm not actually playing it for the money, even if they do pay me. Um, so that's one thing. On the second thing, I actually have always had a good balance. And so I have always a uh, lot of focus on family, spending time with my kids, um, staying in shape. And I had to cut back other things when I was running a company. I had to cut back on cultural activities, watching sports, things I enjoyed, even spending time with friends that was cut, wasn't eliminated, but it was cut back. And there are different phases. Now I'm, I'm you know, older, my kids are in college. Um, I can spend more time uh, both working, traveling, intellectual, athletics, going to Burning Man every year, you know, doing, uh, you know, super fun things. Uh, so there are different phases in life. The key is I tell people you can't do everything, but you, you can you can do anything, but you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. And so you've just got to have discipline, just like you need it in college. You know, you can't be on four sports teams, run three organizations and get straight A's. It's just not a possibility. You have to choose and don't spread it thinly. Be strong in three areas and feel good about that. Kevin, thank you so much for, you know, all this insight. I think closing off the last question is just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. It's just such practical life advice for anyone um, embarking on an entrepreneurship journey or, or anything else in life, really. Um, thank you so much for your insight. Uh, and it's a real, real pleasure to have you here. I'll hand the time over now back to um, Trisha. Um, 
Thank you. Um, I want to thank so I really want to thank um, Kevin Ryan for being here with us tonight um, for our two moderators and the incredible um, conversation that we've had. Um, I do want to remind everyone that um, we hope to see you again coming up on uh, uh, September 22nd. We have our next uh, event on uh, US-China relations. This is part of an, an, a new and ongoing series. Uh, on October 7th, we will have a discussion on um, global mental health challenges in the post-COVID world. To make sure you don't miss anything, please use the link uh, in the chat that you can see to sign up for our mailing list. Um, and again, thank you so much for such an amazing and um, insightful conversation. Thank you to our viewers for the great questions. And we will see all of you again soon. Good night. <laughs>